All right, welcome back to our podcast episode, ladies and gentlemen. This is Sam Kwok from the Kwok Brothers, real estate investor, and we have a very special guest today, Jason Hall, here to speak in his experience. And uh, I'm going to introduce Jason a little bit here, and I'm, I'm going to have him fill in most of the, the uh, blanks and the uh, the details. But Jason has been working with many and countless individuals, uh, especially property managers, in helping them develop their business, uh, allowing them to grow their accounts. So Jason has a lot of insight having to have worked with many different entrepreneurs and business owners uh, across the nation. So I got Jason here as a special guest. Hey, what's going on, Jason? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me, Sam. Absolutely. So uh, Jason, um, why don't you share a little bit about what you do, uh, your, your vision, so to speak, for your, your business? And um, yeah, and tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so, um, so I'm Jason Hall, and our company is called Door Grow. And our vision or our mission or our why is to transform property management businesses and their owners. And so what that means is we want to change the entire industry. You know, the property management industry has generally been viewed as kind of the ugly cousin of real estate. And, um, and it's kind of rightly so deserved or earned sort of a bad reputation because there are a lot of struggling business owners that run property management companies and the industry really deals with a lot of challenges when it comes to awareness mm -hmm. and perception. And, um, our goal is to take these businesses that have been working far too hard, getting far too little return and help them grow. And so right. I consider myself a bit of a growth hacker, I guess, or a growth <laughs> consultant. Sure. And, and how, how long have you been doing that for, uh, Jason? Well, uh, so I, uh, over a decade ago, I started a web design company mm -hmm. and, uh, called open potion and really quickly we started work, working with property management companies. I have my first, one of my first people to help was my brother who uh, has a property management company in Orange County. And I think they've got over 1200 doors now mm -hmm. uh, they're doing really well <clears throat> but he had purchased or bought into a, one of the you know popular franchises in the property management space and didn't have a clue and was just using yeah. the tools they gave him and he was really kind of struggling to get started and um and i took a look at what he was given and i was like well some of the stuff just seemed really off it, it seemed really obvious to me as a marketer that we need to make sure that we were targeting the right target audience which mm -hmm. was not tenants you know was not having pay rents as the biggest call to action on the website sure. and um and then what we did for him became really popular among mm -hmm. his fellow franchisees and they wanted it corporate wasn't too happy about it to be honest, but, mm -hmm. um, but we were helping, helping their franchisees. And so a lot of them started coming to us, some of these guys with thousands of doors and, um, and they were great websites for us to do because we got some really great backlinks and really quickly we were on the first page of Google and we started getting nice. clients all over the U S and, um, and that exposed me to, um, property management in a really interesting way. I was kind of the fly on the wall mm -hmm. in their business. And I, I'm the kind of guy that we didn't just build websites to be pretty like most graphic designers would. Sure. My goal was to make it effective to make money. And so we, I asked a lot of questions. I would spend on average with most of my clients, maybe about six to eight hours digging wow. into their business figuring out their target audience. And it didn't take very long before it turned more into me telling them who they should be targeting right, right. and how they should be communicating with them. And, um, and, and it shifting more into almost like a coaching or consulting thing. And what's funny is I used to do that for free just so I could get a website deal. Right. <laughs> so eventually I had a client, well, I had a, a client, a potential client that went through this planning and discovery process with me mm. and then said, great, I'm going to go have somebody in India do it. Mm. So, um, I believe that guy eventually got blacklisted by Google <laughs> for oh, wow. really doing some illegal backlinking stuff and stuff. Yeah. That Google laid the, the ban hammer on down on this guy. But, mm. um, so, you know, karma kind of caught up with them, but it was my own fault. I realized at the time that I wasn't charging 
for something that was really valuable. Right. And so then I started charging for that. And then it's gradually over time shifted towards us really just focusing on that property management niche. And then we eventually a few years ago launched door grow mm -hmm. as a brand and went all in focusing on that niche. And it's been far more effective for us as a business. And I'm really passionate about helping that industry because I see a lot of potential there. Yeah, you know, I, I like one thing that you mentioned that you started charging for your services, which uh, some people are like, well, shouldn't you be, right? But I think another question or another topic to be mentioned there, and I think this, this sometimes you, um, this, this, some, this seems to be the uh, hurdle, uh, an obstacle, so to speak, to a lot of business owners, but they don't charge enough for their services and their products. And what tends to happen, what I've seen, is when, people, when businesses or services, whether it's coaching or business <clears throat> development, um, they, they don't take it as, as, as seriously. They, you know, they're like, oh, this is just, you know, I paid 100 bucks for this, I've, I've, I don't have much to lose. Uh, for example, uh, I just paid uh, 10 grand for some uh, business development coaching for my real estate business. And um, had I not paid that 10 grand, I would not have taken it seriously. I would have been, you know, I would have said, you know, um, I didn't pay much, so I'm going to schedule it for another day, right? So I scheduled it, in fact, today, and uh, I, I was obsessed over it. I was like, man, I, I really don't want to lose that 10 grand worth of value that I paid in. Uh, so I, I actually got more out of uh, working with that coach, uh, more value. I was more attentive, right? I actually even turned off my phone because I wanted to make, make sure I was focused on what I was doing here. And I think that's 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 something to be um, that's something to be talked about with with the business owners. And I think you 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 would agree, right? Oh yeah, uh, I I think there's a balance. So one of my core philosophies when it comes to sales is to give people value before asking for value. Right. And you know, in business, one mistake that we make, I think a lot of business owners make, is we we make all these claims. We're like, if you give me money, we'll give you value later. And they're <laughs> like, well, there's so much, you know crap out there how do I know that I'm really right. gonna get value uh, especially in my arena which is kind of connected to internet marketing or growth hacking right. I mean, there's a lot of BS out there and so people are pretty gun-shy and so so on one side we make sure that we give a lot of value podcasts mm -hmm. episodes on our door grow show um, we've created free calculators and free tools and some of these operate like lead magnets for us and help us attract business sure. as well but we give a lot of value away for free. And I tell my sales team, like, just be helpful. Find right. out what their problems are and find podcast episodes, find things we've talked about, find tools, whatever, like give them, give them resources, give them help. Right. Because the second we give value, then they're going to trust us and then we can start asking for value. Now the opposite is also true where I was at before where I was giving away massive amount of value and tons of my time mm -hmm. basically consulting them for free with the hope of some future payout which basically sent the message that this time was worthless sure right because it was free and um and i really got no pushback in fact my sales increased when i started charging for those discovery sessions mm -hmm. cuz i it, that was a lower price point it was easier to get into than saying hey do a 10 grand website with me or do some some big sure. you know big huge thing and i'd say just do this and at the end of it, it you'll have this really solid roadmap you'll strategically know how to how your website should be laid out and then if you trust anyone else to implement it better than us you can take it to them but right. by the end of that process you won't trust anybody else to do it Mm -hmm. as good as we can and sure. that was always true and I was able to significantly increase my pricing because I was no longer a commodity I was now a resource that right. they trusted and I think that's that's something everybody needs to figure out how to do in whatever industry they're in is figure out how do I get out of being a commodity and I'm commo you know I'm like every single other realtor I'm like every single other property manager or every single other widget that's out there how can I bring real value and personal connection to sure. the play? And I think we live in this world that's like overly automated, overly systemized, and I'm a big fan of going counter to what everybody else is doing. And one of those ways of doing that is creating real personal connection. And, sure. and my team, like we talk about that a lot, like let's go deeper instead of going broader, trying to reach more people, let's go more personal with the people that we can touch. And I think that pays off. It's really effective and it's mm -hmm. really 
different and people don't expect it. Right. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So in, in regards to um, the real estate side of things, now people who are watching this podcast, you might be looking, you might be a real estate investor looking to manage your own properties or um, you're looking to raise money. And I think Jason hit it right on the, on the, uh, on the head as far as if you want to raise money, you don't want to necessarily be the, the every other investor out in the world. You want to have, you want to be uh, known as a source of resource to where people can ask you questions about what's going on in the real estate market and you'll be able to give them a very, very intelligent answer, val valuable answer, I might add, uh, to what's happening in the real estate market, which um, ultimately leads down to a path where an individual may trust you uh, enough to you know, invest 100000 200000 500000 in a partnership uh, in a deal with you. So Jason hit it right on the neck, uh, on the head, I should say, uh, and I think that, that's phenomenal. So Jason, uh, you working with many property managers, uh, what, what, what seems to be the common thread that you see as most managers see as a challenge? So they have this challenge, right? And what seems to be the common challenge that you see with property managers all across the United States? Well, I think, I think a lot of times we, in our head, imagine that, um, whatever we're dealing with is very unique to our industry. Sure. But really th all the basic things that we deal with or take clients through are things that are affecting every type of business. Small businesses in general are struggling. Mm -hmm. um, I had Mike Michalowicz on my show and, um, and he wrote the book Profit First and Pumpkin Plan and some of these entrepreneurial books. And, and one of the things he had mentioned is that um, his mission is to stamp out entrepreneurial poverty. And he mm -hmm. quoted a, real, a bunch of horrible statistics about how common it is for businesses to, to struggle and fail. Uh, you know, most businesses fail in the first five years, like a significant portion fail in the first year. But even worse than that, is that most businesses that stay alive are struggling and living in entrepreneurial poverty. Mm -hmm. That's the scary thing is that, that yes, businesses fail. And so some people are like, well, if I survive, then everything's okay. The reality is if you survive, you're far more likely to be living paycheck to paycheck, starving, you're coming home and your spouse is saying, where's the money? And you're like, I'm working my butt off. And it, it creates a lot of pressure and noise and it's really scary. And a lot of people paint this glorified picture of entrepreneurism, but it can be really lonely. It can be really alienating. And, um, and they get a lot of bad advice because let's be honest, marketers are the worst people to go to for marketing <laughs> advice a lot of times because what are they going to tell you to do? Right. What are they selling, right? And so, I mean, who is it? Seth Godin has a book called All Marketers Are Liars, yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then he has it crossed out and says, tell stories, right? <laughs> so, and I don't believe it's because marketers intentionally seek out to manipulate or lie. There are some like that. I think, I believe most entrepreneurs of marketing firms do want to make a difference and help. I think what happens though, is that most marketers are the smartest, they think, thing to sell is what everybody comes to them and asks for. So what everybody comes to me and asks for is SEO. Mm. or pay-per-click because these are the things they know. These are things they've heard of, but these are not the things that are the most effective to help property managers grow their businesses right now sure. in general. And they're really, it's really difficult to get the top spot on Google. It's really difficult to dethrone Goliath uh, unless you ha if you're trying to fight Goliath the same way that Goliath would fight if you're David, sure. right? David would get his ass kicked by Goliath if he went out there with a sword shield and all the same armor and he's puny compared to Goliath, mm -hmm. but he found a hack. He did something different. He did something unique, something that played to his strengths that he could do and compete. So doing all the same stuff, pay-per-click, social media, content marketing, um, all this kind of stuff. And you're competing with big companies that have big budgets and are doing it. And you're a small business owner. It really is. Uh, it really feels humiliating and, and defeating to try and play that game when all the cards are stacked against you. Yeah, it's, it's like trying to take a, a, a quick route pill, right? People see this, you know, SEO, you know, pay-per-click type of uh, marketing model and they see it as an opportunity. Oh, I'm going to get instant sales by next month. You know, we're going to have, we're going to be able to double our sales by next month if we, if we do this. And unfortunately, a lot of marketers create this grandiose pipe dream for a lot of people 
Um, and, and and I think you you and I both agree that a, a relevant marketing strategy, an effective marketing strategy, is one of uh, one that plays in the long term, uh, something that deliver, delivers value in the long term. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, what really is effective is whatever gets results. Sure. So whatever works. And my personal mission statement in life is to inspire others to love true principles. And so what that means to me is I love to figure out what actually works. Like that's fun for me, like uh, reading books, taking courses. I shall probably 60, 70K a year or more. I don't know, my, my team yeah. could probably tell me on just coaches and mentors. And um, I love figuring out what works and figuring out what works results are the and reality are the same thing to me results and reality that's truth that's what actually works and that's the bottom line and so if 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 it's not working what's crazy is people still keep doing it most people don't even look and assess where their leads are actually coming from most property management business owners what's working is word of mouth mm -hmm. but when they look at their cold lead sources the revenue and the number of deals they're closing connected to that is really, really small, sure. but that's way more expensive. And wow. so I think, I think there's really effective things that business owners can do. And so what we do with property management companies, I think that's unique or different is I just went, I just attacked it from the mindset or the standpoint of what would I do if I were starting a property management company? How would I compete? What would I tell my brother to do in his business? Mm -hmm. What would I tell my dad to do who started his business just a couple years ago and he's at like 200 doors? Sure. These are the things that I put together, that we put together in kind of our consulting package and process that we take clients through. And it's really focused on basic elements of the business. And I view marketing like this. Most people think you could just go sh hand money to a marketer, right? I'll give him money this marketer or her, and then in return, they will give me contracts and deals, right? That, that's like this myth. But what really you end up doing, what all a marketing agency or company can really give you, if they're really honest, are cold leads. Mm -hmm. Cold leads convert really poorly, generally. They don't know you trust you or like you, but you have contact information and you can work those leads. So unless you have a really good nurturing process or the ability as a badass to close deals and can warm them up and get them aligned with you and help them know, trust, and like you, then you're not going to be getting deals out of that. It really sometimes feels like you're trying to squeeze blood from a stone. <laughs> and, yeah. and so the challenge is, this is what most people are doing in business. You see small business owners all the time going, oh, if I just had the top spot on Google, I mean, there's a lot of things better than the top spot on Google. Like one of the things better than the top spot on Google is having the best reviewed company on Yelp or the best reviewed company on Google Maps, you know, or for example, there's a lot of things better than having the top spot on Google because those convert and give you warm leads. Conversion rates are really high. They work like word of mouth. And so I think people just need to question things and look at things a little bit differently. Because if you go to a marketer and say, I need SEO, he would be stupid to say, well, we actually sell this. Um, I'm not going to sell this to you because I think there might be something better. That's what we decided to do at DoorGrow. So most people probably think we're crazy. And it's not, it's not as easy to sell what we do because it's so different. We have to first educate them and convince them that there's something maybe better for them to be focusing on than SEO. Because otherwise, they're really funneling their cold leads into a whole pipeline that is leaky. And so the way I look at businesses is it, there's major functions that exist in, in a sales pipeline all the way from the very beginning of awareness all the way through to getting a signed contract or getting a deal or a sale or whatever you want to call it. And between there, there's a lot of steps in that process. And each of those steps has a percentage decrease or a level of attrition. There's a percentage of loss at each of these stages throughout the sales funnel. And most businesses go and turn on the marketing spigot at the front end while the hose has like six or seven major leaks in it. Mm -hmm. And at the other end, they're trying to water this little plant they call their business and hope they can get fruit off of it to feed their children. And the reality is until they shore up all these leaks, it doesn't make sense to turn the spigot on full blast. Right. They need to patch up this hose. So that's how we built our process is let's take care of all of this. And then instead of turning on the spigot of marketing for property managers right now, I think it makes a lot of sense to focus on 
prospecting methods and methods of creating connection and relationship and increasing word of mouth because a lot of the cold lead marketing stuff isn't really effective. But even if they decide to do the cold lead marketing, if they shore up all the leaks, it's far more effective because it's not just going down the drain and falling right. out of the hose, right? So, Yeah, I think a lot of business owners, uh, property managers like, underestimate the amount of touches uh, or, or the nurturing that they have to do to really fully convert a, a lead uh, into a being, being a customer. And, and I, I picked this up from a book called, uh, and I think you might have read it, uh, called Fanatical Prospecting uh, by Jeb Blount, if I'm saying his name mm -hmm. right. But uh, mm -hmm. reading that book uh, made me understand that um, for a larger ticket item sale, <laughs> let's say, it takes up to 50 touches, if not more, to convert someone from being a, a lead to being a, 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 you know, a customer for your business. So I, I think you're, you're right there. I mean, uh, I think you and Jeb both agree and I, I'd, I'd also agreed as well. So, um, so kind of wrapping up here, Jason, um, what, what's one particular, I would say one last message for, uh, a business owner looking to grow their, their business, especially on the marketing and sales side. What would you say as, as a final summary tip that you would give them, uh, if they're just looking to get started? I think for any business or industry, and um, I think one of the things is to question their assumptions. Because if you take a look back as a real estate agent or as a property manager or as a, a, an entrepreneur running any business or company, um, there's a lot of assumptions that people assume. Oh, I can't make, I, I can't make money unless I have a website. That's not true. Mm -hmm. right? It is possible. Does a website help? Sure. Yeah, it can help a lot, but only if the website is effective at creating trust and converting. Does my website make people feel safe and convert? Mm -hmm. Does it answer like the three core questions people have? Like, what do you do and why should I choose you to do it over your competitors? And what do you want me to do? Like, where's the call to action? There's all these basic things. I think if they just started looking at it from their customer's perspective and asking questions, and one of the best ways to do that is just go to your customers and ask them, why did you pick me? What sort of process did you go through in your decision making? And then maybe even if you can, ask people that didn't go with you. Hey, I know you went with somebody else. I'm just curious. It would really help me out and get feedback. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you get real feedback, and that's the advantage I had in the property management industry, is I just asked a lot of questions. Hundreds and hundreds sure. of questions from hundreds and hundreds of companies. And I think we need to start questioning our assumptions. If you assume if I just had the top spot on Google, would my business be better? Yeah, maybe it would be better. But I think the, the built-in assumption is that you have to have the top spot on Google in order to win and succeed. That's not true either. Mm -hmm. I've got clients who have no ranking on Google and they have... Um, They've done no SEO and no pay-per-click and no marketing and no search engine marketing, no social media, and they're closing deals left and right, and they're outpacing some of the biggest competitors in their market mm -hmm. because they started doing other stuff. They started going out and prospecting, hanging out with real estate investor groups, connecting with their actual target audience. And so I think if you look, where's my customer at? Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite analogies to look at is hunting. Like it's real simple. If you're going to go out and go hunting, and I don't really go hunting, but I love the analogy. If, you, if you're going to go out and go hunting, then you need to go where the game is. You're not going to mm -hmm. go hunt deer maybe in the, in the middle of you know, the desert, for example, or you're probably not going to go, uh, if you're looking to capture a rare lizard you're not gonna, that's only in the desert, you're not going to go into like the jungle, for example. So you have to figure out where is my target audience? Where do they hang out? Where are they at? Where can I actually go and physically connect and meet these people? And, and then work back for, backwards from there. And how can, I, how can I shore up some of these leaks throughout my, my system and throughout my process? Sure. Where am I losing people? How can I create those relationships? And so I think just questioning assumptions is a really powerful thing. And, um, and just recognize that any advice that you get from anybody is going to come skewed because they're probably trying to sell you something. And so you need to question those assumptions too. Like, do they really, are their values aligned with me? Mm -hmm. And would they really tell me if there was something better? Right. So Absolutely. Now, very well said, Jason. I appreciate your, your you know, summary input. 
for uh, entrepreneurs and business owners alike. So uh, real quick, um, Jason, so how, how, did, how do people reach you? How, how, can, how can they find you? All right, so it's not hard to find me. If you want to connect or follow me or yeah. see what kind of weird stuff I'm up to, I like to post a lot of stuff to disrupt people's mindset or connect with entrepreneurs. I am King Jason Hull, that's H-U-L-L, mm -hmm. on all social media channels. So okay. you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you're into, King Jason Hull. And, um, and if you want to check out DoorGrow, if you have a property management business, uh, or you've got a property management arm to your real estate business that is struggling and you feel like you don't, you wish you'd never started it. We mm -hmm. can turn that around. And so check out uh, doorgrow.com and uh, we've got a lot of really cool free resources for you there. Awesome. Yeah. And so I'm going to wrap it up real quick. This is, I promise this is the last one before people think, you're uh, an Ali G impersonator. What is that glasses that you're wearing? <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny. I, um, sometimes when I'm at conferences, so people are like, I, I, people come up to me like, what do, you, what do you think you're Bono? You're trying to be Bono or something? <laughs> I'm like, no, um, it's actually, I'm just really nerdy. I'm a biohacker. And so, um, so these orange glasses are blue light blocking glasses. And so by blocking blue light, it just reduces the fatigue on your eyes significantly. And so I stare at screens a lot during the day and, um, and it's artificial lighting and artificial lighting has a harsher array of blue light than even sunlight does typically. And so it's really difficult or harsh on the eyes. And so if my eyes start getting tired, I'll throw on the orange glasses and I also wear them early in the morning and I wear them at night and it just um, it just allows me to get more done and stay more productive to, uh, to, to do that. I sleep better at night. It allows me to, uh, blue light, blocking the blue light allows your brain to start producing melatonin before bed. And so I block, they help block out all the artificial blue light that's just naturally in your house. So I don't think it's enough to just turn your phone screen yellow when you have like lights all over your house. Right, night, right. So. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, th thanks for sharing that. That's uh, an interesting bit, bit there. So uh, Jason, I appreciate you coming on board on our podcast. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for getting on board and sharing your tips and wisdom there. Uh, and uh, for those, again, wanting to follow Jason, King Jason Hall, I'll have that in the link description below in the, in the YouTube uh, description box in case uh, you, know, you don't know how to spell it, apparently. Uh, so I'll have that thrown in there. So thanks, Jason. Appreciate you. And uh, we'll stay in touch. Thanks, Sam. All right, bye. Well, hello there. You made it to the end of this video, which means you love the video. You liked what you saw. If you want to see more awesome real estate investing videos and podcasts in the future, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to get more notification about our next videos.